we're sitting in the infrared sauna, and the, the question may come up of why use an infrared sauna? Uh, what will it do for you? So you can see we have the heaters are around us, and the infrared works differently than the box of hot rock sauna. So let me explain the difference. The box of hot rock sauna works by heating the, the air up to about 200 degrees. Then the heated air heats the skin. But once it heats the skin, you have perspiration. That's what you want. At that point, there's a layer of water in between you and the hot air. So the infrared sauna is completely different. It operates at about 110 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. So much cooler with the air. You're warmed by the infrared. So the infrared's in front of me to the sides underneath. And infrared is coming in as a wavelength and penetrating in through the soft tissue about an inch, inch and a half. So there's really not magic about it. It's just coming in into the body, but once it penetrates the body, that's where something starts to happen. And that's called vasodilation. So the blood vessels open up. When the blood vessels open up in the body, then the heart starts to pump. As the heart starts to pump, you have oxygenated blood going through the body, bringing healing into the areas that need it. Yeah, All right. So as the blood is, is coming into the body and going to the areas that need healing, you have the oxygen and nutrition. At the same time, it's pulling toxins out of the body. So this is all happening. All is sitting in here and being comfortable, uh, like being in the spa. So it's very simple. The second advantage of the infrared sauna is as you're sitting in here and your heart starts to pump, you're getting an aerobic exercise. I call it passive aerobic exercise. And so you're burning calories, which is always good, at least in my book. So you're burning calories, you're bringing oxygenated blood into the areas that need it, and you're taking toxins out of the, the body. Now the toxins will come out, uh, they will come out in this, through the skin in perspiration, they will come out in the urine and the feces. So there's one other element that happens with the toxicity, and through the infrared penetrating into the cells, it will actually start to vibrate the cell. And that helps to cleave the toxin off so it can be flushed away. Also, as you're sitting in the sauna, in the infrared sauna, well, let me back up. We have two things happening in the body at all times in homeostasis. Homeostasis regulates our temperature, so we never get to one, one temperature to where uh, we're just staying at 98.6. The body is always a little above that, and then when it gets a little high, a receptor says, oh, you're too high. So then it brings the temperature down a little lower. So this happens with the autonomic nervous system, which is parasympathetic and sympathetic. Sympathetic, you know of as running from the tiger. It's, it's a stress response, which is a good response if there's a tiger chasing you. The problem is in our, in our culture now, our, our visceral feeling is that we're always being chased by the tiger. So we have stress hormones going through our bodies. We were never designed to have a tiger chasing us all the time, but that's, that's where we are now. So you may think, well, that's okay. I get a lot of work done, but that's not the idea because in the sympathetic mode, in the being chased by the tiger, you never have a, an opportunity for your body to just stop and to heal. So healing happens in the sympathetic mode, what we call rest and digest. In rest and digest, the relaxation response comes in, you take a deep breath, and the body says, oh, I'm not being chased by the tiger. Let's put some energy into healing, you know, and you fill in the blank. So if we never have that opportunity for deep healing, then this is where chronic disease sets in over time. Chronic disease doesn't just happen. It comes in over time, and, the, and stress is one of the, the biggest, uh, they say stress is one of the biggest killers, but stress is, is one of the biggest reasons that diseases can come into the body and take hold. So as you're sitting in the sauna, detoxification, aerobic, passive exercise, 
healing oxygenated blood. And now, which I think may be one of the most important things, is allowing just time for yourself, no cell phone, uh, no work, no problem, unless you bring your work in with you, which we don't recommend. And, and just time to, to relax down. And it's, it's just, it's critical to health to have these things. Now, I just read the uh, president here in the United States, President Obama, has a council for cancer. And they put out a, a big report. And the council is scientists and doctors. And they study cancer every year. And the last report that came out was over 500 pages. And I read it. And what do you think it said? If you were to not see the cover of that report, it would look like talking about toxicity. It, to me, reading it, 90% of the, of the report was how to avoid toxins in the home, in the workplace. So if the, the U.S. government is saying that if we want to beat cancer, then we have to avoid these toxins. Well, that's not easy because there's toxins in our water, there's toxins in our air, there's toxins in our food. And more importantly, we are receptacles of the toxins. We've been holding toxins in our bodies. They're in there. When our grandparents were around, there are 80,000 chemicals that they were never exposed to that we are exposed to in, in different combinations. So understand, when you do a, a, a clinical trial and you introduce one chemical to the body, you can do a study. If you introduce two chemicals into the study, the variables go way, way up, okay? You can't really even say what's causing the effect. Now imagine 80,000 chemicals that we're all exposed to. We are the greatest experiment that's ever been done uh, in the history of the world, you, you and I. Um, but we were never asked, did we want to participate? And the toxins come into our bodies and they come in to stay. So if it's been shown this direct relationship between toxicity and, and disease, cancer, um, and a whole host of other diseases, then we have to have some way to get the toxins out. Um, so people ask me all the time, how do I know what a good infrared sauna is? So we have been building and um, researching infrared and infrared saunas for about 15 years now. And uh, I can go into a little history of the sauna. So originally the infrared sauna came out about 20 to 30 years ago, depending on how you look at it. And someone came up with an idea that if we put infrared in the walls and projected that onto the body, that we could use that energy to, uh, to perspire and, and get the benefits of relaxation. But the first infrared heaters were very hot. They were ceramic tubes that were used in industrial applications to melt plastics and, and dry paint. So that worked pretty well. Uh, you would perspire. But then we found that there's, a, there's something called a, a PEW, and that's the potential equivalency wavelength. Sounds like a, it's a big phrase. But basically it means that all substances, uh, all material, even the human body, will take in infrared in differing amounts at different micron wavelengths. So the PEW of the human body is about 9.4 microns. So we started working to find what the best wavelength was that you would still perspire, get the toxins out, and the body would take in the infrared more as a healing energy than as a I'm trying to dry paint energy. So that was a process that we went over and we kept refining and kept spreading out the power of the infrared so that it, the body could accept it for healing. So there's a, there's a law called Wien's Law. And by using Wien's Law, Wien's Law says that if you give me the temperature of anything, 
whether that's an infrared sauna heater, the human body, uh, an ice cube, or a brick wall, I can tell you what the wavelength is. So as we spread this heat out on, on the saunas, as the surface temperature went down, the wavelength went up and got closer to what the body could utilize for healing energy. And so as this happened, uh, over a period of time, we came into these large carbon heaters. So number one, for looking for an infrared heater, the carbon heaters are the state of the art as far as uh, generating the best wavelength for the human body. But the carbon heaters, when we first started looking at them about eight years ago, had two big drawbacks. One was that if I put my hand up in front of a, car a regular carbon heater, now this I can feel the heat, uh, but a normal carbon heater, when I get about five inches away, the heat will drop off. It didn't have that emissivity. So what we did was that we put fine ceramic powder inside the matrix, the carbon matrix of the heater, and that gives it what I call punch or emissivity. Because in the infrared sauna, you want to feel that. So that was the first drawback that we overcame. Now I can feel the infrared wherever I am in the sauna. The second drawback of these large carbon heaters is that it gave off huge amounts of EMF. So EMF is sometimes called EMR, or electromagnetic radiation. And if you just uh, Google that, you'll come up with a, a whole host of, of things. It's what people talk about in the cell phone, why you shouldn't hold cell phones up to your head. So we saw this as a huge no. disadvantage. Uh, okay. and we actually I'm just talking about for putting it together. Yeah. Coming from the carbon heaters until we were able to tackle that. And so started at about 80 to 100 milligauss. That's the reading for the EMR. And then we got it down to 60, down to 30. And we just had a breakthrough about a year and a half ago to where we're about 2.53 milligauss. And so where you're sitting, you're not getting any of that uh, dirty electricity. So the second thing uh, to look at with the infrared sauna would be just the, the quality of the cabinet, the construction, the type of woods. A lot of uh, uh, units are coming in from uh, China, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But you have to research and make sure that the, the solvents, the glues, uh, the type of wood, how the wood is treated, isn't impinging on your health. So just like the EMR or the EMF, it, you don't want to get into a box or a closed area where you think you're coming in to heal and you're increasing your toxic burden. So, and then the fourth thing uh, for buying an infrared sauna is make sure that you have heaters in the front. A lot of sauna manufacturers will go for just an all-glass front because it looks stylish, it looks modern. Well, that's okay. Except understand that infrared works as a wavelength in a straight line. And we're trying to detoxify the body and a lot of the toxins reside in adipose tissue. Well, unfortunately I have more adipose tissue in the front than I'd like, but I'd like to detoxify what I have. So I need heaters in the front. So the next thing to look for would be make sure that the heaters don't go above the shoulders. And people say, well, why? Well, you don't want to heat the head. Number one, there's, it's a waste of energy because most of the energy is just going to bounce off the cranium. So I want to concentrate the infrared energy where it can do the maximum amount of good, and that is being directed onto, the, onto my body. So to get a benefit that you will see over a period of time, we recommend using infrared sauna at least three times a week for 20 to 30 minutes. So you want to start with that and build up. Now, if you're in a very toxic situation or if you're compromised in any way, always consult with your local physician. Tell them what you're going to do because uh, as you get in the sauna, it's very safe. But if you start to unload toxins too quickly, you can get what is called a healing reaction. And that is if you feel a little nauseous, if you feel a little lightheaded, 
then get out of the sauna and uh, drink fluids. So you always want to drink fluids. And then we'll start people in a protocol with the door open. So you don't have to have the door closed in order to get the benefit of the infrared. It's still coming into the body and releasing the toxins. But if you're starting out uh, and have a big toxic burden, which you can find out, there are different ways to test your toxic level. Uh, then you may want to start slowly, and as the toxins come out, you'll be able to stay in to the sauna longer. So after using the sauna, you always want to take a shower, or at the very least, towel off, because you'll have toxins on the skin, and you want to get those out as quickly as possible. Just as they use some transdermal patches to put different drugs into the body, the toxins can be pulled back in, and we don't want that. So something that you can do to have even greater benefit of the infrared sauna is to use dry brushing. So a dry brush is a, a long natural bristled handle with a brush on the end and you just vigorously you always want to to brush towards the heart and you can do this before the sauna and this will help to stimulate the the skin uh, so that you can get everything ready to be expelled. And you can also do this after the sauna as a way of getting everything out so use either a dry brush or a set of rough towels. I know that there's some doctors that do this also as a part of the therapy, just to make sure that you get everything out and, like I said, wash off and get the toxins out uh, uh, to the best of your ability. That's a great way to go. So people ask me all the time, what temperature should I set the sauna at? So we tell them, set the sauna at the maximum temperature that your sauna will go and just leave it there forever. We, we don't want the sauna cycling on and off because we want the maximum heat coming from the infrared heaters at all times so that you have 100% infrared all the time. If it gets too hot, you can open the door a crack or there's a, a vent in the top. Uh, you can bring water with you or you can even get out and walk around a little time. So there's been questions about uh, different types of woods. So we use uh, cedar. Cedar is one of the best woods uh, that we've ever used uh, for many reasons. And it's been, that's why it's been used traditionally for saunas for thousands of years. So we get our cedar out of British Columbia. It's all ecologically harvested, FSC, that's Forest Sustainability Council certified. And we use that to make our saunas. The reason that the cedar wood is so good in making a sauna is that it, the oil, the healing oil, they use it actually in healing for aromatherapy, the cedar oil, is naturally antifungal and antibacterial. So as you sit in the sauna, you've got moisture, you've got perspiration, and I'm sure you've got some... So having the cedar wood helps to keep that down. So that's number one. Number two... I'd rather have something beautiful in my house, no, and I love the cedar wood. Old glass. Three, yeah, the cedar is dimensionally I mean, stable, is even when it heats up and cools down. So over a period of time, the sauna will heat up and cool down, and the cedar wood will resist cracking for a long period of time. It's just, it's just a great wood to use in the sauna. After a while, after you've used your sauna, even if you put down towels, there may be areas where there's some darkening, where there's been perspiration and just come in with some 200 grit sandpaper and a light sanding will bring out the fresh cedar wood and that's all you have to do just a very light sanding and you're back to new wood so we use the cedar for that and now we also have a whole line of saunas that use aspen wood and people say well why aspen some people if they are very very ill and they have uh, environmental illnesses can't tolerate even the cedar oil so aspen is a hypoallergenic wood. It is also a beautiful blonde wood, and we use that as well. Now, in, in that type of sauna, though, you, we you normally use, in a clinical setting, we'll use hydrogen peroxide, oh, depending on how many people are using the sauna, and just a very light um, with a cloth on the wood where people are sitting, and that will purify it. In the cedar, you don't have to do that in the aspen uh, that's one thing you have to do, especially in a clinical setting. So those are the woods that we use and, and recommend. But, uh... So we use 
use an edible, uh, non-toxic carpenter's glue, like a white glue. And it, I've eaten it. It's um, not that nutritious. It doesn't taste that good, but it's totally non-toxic. And we took it one step farther to where we had the VOC testing. That's where they come in with very precise measuring equipment and uh, over a period of many hours they will measure with the sauna off, with the sauna on for VOCs or volatile organic uh, chemicals. And we've gotten a clean bill of health with that and if anyone ever wants to see that uh, very expensive report we'd be happy to send it on to you. So when you get your sauna people have asked me how do I put it together so your sauna has been designed to be very uh, easy to put together with a minimal amount of uh, any type of screws and you know things like that in the cedar line of saunas they go together without any tools and just snap together so it comes as a knockdown so that means that these wall sections are already completed the heaters are in the light bulb is in the light the stereo is in the ceiling it's basically just putting the floor down and setting the four walls and they'll either hook or snap together so you're looking at maybe an hour to put the whole thing together the top goes on like a shoebox lid anywhere where there's an electrical connection it just plugs in and everything is labeled and there's instructions but it's not like the erector set on Christmas putting the bicycle together for three it's none of that so we we stayed away from that so the good news is that in this construction, if you ever move, you just unsnap it and take it with you. And presently, all the models just plug into normal household current. So that's not a problem either. No special wiring. So we're going to test the EMF on an older sauna that does not have a no EMF heater and want to show you what it looks like. So this is the tri-field meter. It's the standard of the industry and I'm going to set it right now. First I'm going to test the battery. You can see that works. And I'm going to put it on 0 to 100 milligauss. So I'm going to come over to a side heater here and let's see. Oh, there we go. Okay. So we're pulling about 25 to 30 milligauss, which now I've seen some of these on the uh, some of the sauna heaters, the needle will jump right up uh, in the 80 to 100 milligauss range. So this is uh, not good. I wouldn't sit in this sauna, but uh, not bad as saunas go. So we'll go over and now we're going to show you our no EMF heater technology. So now we're getting in the sauna with our no EMF technology and we have the tri-field meter. We're going to test the battery, put it on 0 to 100 and the sauna is on. We're going to come in and see. So now we get a little there, see, about one milligauss and come over. Just a very little. So you can see as we pull away and where you're sitting. Now the recommendation is for EMF to have no more than two and a half to three. So we're, we're well within that limit and where you're sitting it's going to be about zero. So this is a infrared sauna heater and I'll show you the back of it. This basically you have a, a carbon fiber matrix here with a copper strip running through. And it's made up of many layers of pre-impregnated fiber that are then bonded together with heat and high pressure. So in this, if you wanted to create a way to make EMF, this would be the perfect way, okay? And that's with just electricity streaming across this from one side to the other. So you can imagine that it's creating a lot of EMF. And EMF is related also to the cycles of the electricity. So you've heard of 50 hertz, 60 hertz. And so that would show up in, in a spike as the electricity is coming through there like that. 
and that's how the EMF would come out. And like I said, we have clocked these, uh, some of these heaters that we've seen in other saunas at 80 to 100 milligauss, which is just way too high. And now I'm going to show you how we silenced the field, how we made a uh, low EMF heater. So, as I said, you have, let's, if we call this a positive or anode and a cathode, and the, the electricity is coming across, positive, negative, positive, negative, we took these, and because of that pattern, we took two heaters, and then we just reversed it, okay? And by making a heater out of two heaters, that when one heater is in the downside, the other heater is in the upside of creating the EMF. And it's like, it's like two arrows meeting in midair. They hit, and they cancel each other out. So that's the technology, and that's how we, uh, we came up with it, and that's how it works.